You want success? TDS. Ryan's Mobile One. Hey guys, I'm back. Where's part six of the Subaru fix anyway? That one's coming up, but there's some things I wanted to cover first. I thought it would be best to do this video, then the paint booth video, and then the Subaru video because it's kind of incremental. It's a whole specialty to get work to turn out good. Anyway, here's how you make your work turn out good. Half of it's this, half the booth. Let's begin. Paint crash course. Paint. Do you speak it? Do you know the language? Uh, there's a lot of acronyms to paint, and if you're gonna buy paint, what, which paint are you gonna buy? What is this, what is that? They're gonna ask you, do you want this or this? Because there's a lot of shorthand speak for some basic stuff, and I'm gonna gift that language to you right now. Most important thing to know is TDS. Can I get a TDS with that paint? And that means technical data sheet. It's like the instructions, because you got stuff on the can, and it's fine print in all these languages, and you can't read it. Get a TDS, they break it down and make it simple. How much do I mix? How long do I wait? What do I gotta do as far as application? What size nozzle paint gun do I use? It'll tell you all that, what pressure, like everything you need to know about the paint to have success is in the TDS. You want success? TDS. There's paint guns, these three are acronyms. Uh, paint guns have come a long way. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about it, but paint used to just <laughs> fog the crap out of everything. You couldn't even see what you were doing, and not a lot of paint went onto the panel. That's both expensive in terms of environmental costs and money. I want I bought the paint for the car, not the air. I'm not trying to throw it away. It's not, you know, I was throwing $100 bills out, right? So the first attempt of that was high volume, low pressure, HVLP. That's what that means. You'll see this in the TDS. It was more efficient, but it was hard to get good work. You, it was easy to get orange peel. <laughs> it was easy to still make a big mess uh, because it's got a really big hole because it's high volume, a lot of air going, but not very fast, right? Fast air breaks it up and makes it into fine droplets. Uh, this does bigger droplets, which are perfect for doing primer. Uh, we're going to talk about primer here in a minute. I use my HVLP gun for basically primer and sealer. Sealer is like a watered down primer with a hardening agent that just makes everything smooth and nice so that you have a good result. Okay? okay. Uh, HTE is high transfer efficiency. It was the next generation of the HVLP. HTE guns, instead of having like a 1.7 to a 2.0 millimeter nozzle or opening like a high volume, a low volume will have a smaller opening. High transfer efficiency, 1.3 millimeters. I love it. It's efficient, it transfers the paint great, and it gets you a nice smooth finish. It's great. Uh, open, what do they mean by open? Does it mean that the store where you buy the paint is open? No, open means whether it's dried to the point where it's not venting, it's not flashing anymore. Kick is when it transfers from being liquid and soft and breathable to being hard kicks and then when it's all done kicking then it will have flashed and then it is no longer open. <laughs> uh, 1K and 2K, 1000 and 2000, right? No, that's not what that means. 1K means that it's not 2K, 2K means that it has hardener. That's it, that's it. Where does the K come from? European spelling component. In uh, Sweden and in German, in German is Componente. Componente. In Sweden, is a uh, component. Component. In reality, hardener is a catalyst. Catalyst makes more sense than the K rule still applies. Catalyst. Catalysator. Catalysator. So that's where the K comes from. To component, but there's lots of components in paint. It can still be 1K. You got reducers, uh, you got hardeners, you got. Uh, Wait a second, I said hardener. That would make it a 2K. That is the key. So it should be, you know, with or without hardener. That's all the 1K and 2K means. Everybody gets this confused with single stage and base clear. Because base clear, you're two different components. So there's a component of the color that's underneath, and then there's the clear shiny stuff on top. Is that what it? No. Forget that. All it means, 2K means hardener in it. Catalysator. So that it will absolutely dry. Let's talk about more two kinds of stuff. There's two kinds of semicolon bonds. Uh, there's mechanical or chemical. When paint flashes, there's another period of time, it's usually 24 hours from the time you painted it, 
that you can spray over the top of it with another urethane or another enamel. There's two kinds of paint, right? And it will kind of glue and melt together. The reducer, which are the acetone or the solvent that has to flash and evaporate out, will get into the lower paint and it will grab onto it and that's the chemical bond. If you wait more than 24 hours, then you have to rely on a mechanical bond. Think sandpaper, right? Scratch it, scuff it up, and then it can hold on to the scratches. I can't hold on to the whiteboard for the life of me, but I can hold on to this, right? I can rock climb up the top of that because I've got something to grab onto. That is the mechanical bond that you create by scratching it with sandpaper. So if it's been longer than 24 hour, you can get it back open by taking that hard crusty top off and creating a mechanical bond. What about bare metal? Can you just do whatever you want over bare metal? You can, but it's gonna suck. So you use primer. There's two, there's three kinds. There's the, the fast, probably four or even more. But the kinds that people spray through their paint guns that you and I would be doing, there's two of them. There's acid etch, and there's a special acid that eats metal. It doesn't eat Bondo, it doesn't eat paint, it eats metal. So only spray it on the metal, sand it off the other stuff, do whatever it takes, feather it in, right? Acid etch, and then there's epoxy. Epoxy primer sticks to everything that epoxy can stick to. So you got epoxy primer and etch primer for bare metal. And then the coating systems, there's base clear where you put down base and then you do, and then you wait long enough and then uh, do the other over the top of it. And there's also two coats of everything. You want to do what we call a tack coat. Tack is in sticky. And we'll talk about tack cloths, which are dinner. dinner. It's what for dinner, tack cloths. You do a tack coat. It's not shiny, it's not smooth, you're just basically shooting droplets at it and letting those droplets anchor in. If you do too much, too fast, and you don't kick yourself out in time, <laughs> you can have a disaster. You can have runs, and you can also have it where you're piling. You say all the solvent hasn't flashed off yet, and you put more on top, then those solvents can react with each other and make it all wavy and crinkly and just ruin everything. Or, got too much, it hasn't come off, it can come up through and make little holes. The solvent, even as a gas, still dissolves. And it can dissolve its way and work up like through like a volcano coming up through the mantle of the earth or something and then, and then it collapses. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't pile up like a volcano that you can sand flat. That would be cool. All you chemists out there, come, with a, come up with a paint that doesn't do these collapsing pinholes uh, from putting too much too fast, right? With single stage, it's a one-shot deal. If you, if you are hot snot, you can, and it's usually cheap stuff, <laughs> it doesn't last very long. Um, it lasts about as long as a rattle can. Rattle cans, are those 1K or 2K? Well, there's no hardener to them, so we know that they're 1K. And half of a rattle can by volume is propellant, like half of that weight is propellant so whatever your can of rattle can stuff is you're only getting this much paint did you know that i didn't know that so 2k stuff and a lot of stuff you get from the paint store you add reducer so you get a pint of paint or a quart or a gallon or whatever and then you mix it one to one with a reducer which is like acetone based kind of stuff but there's a bunch of cool additives that make it not run that make it not pinhole that just really make it not fish eye, cool stuff. And now you got twice as much as you thought you did. But the price of the reducer is about twice as much as what you'd pay for just normal acetone. You get more, you cover more, and you go faster if you go with a paint gun in this kind of method. It's awesome. It is the way to go. Way higher quality clear coat, way higher quality stuff that lasts a lot longer because it's got almost all the clear coats that you get now have UV additive. Um, as far as the single stage paints, they oxidize and they look like crap fast. A lot of factory paints are single stage, but they're top tier. A lot of the single stage that you get um, from your paint jobber isn't high quality, in my experience. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, please. Go with the flow. You need to have good airflow. Remember the old paint guns that used to just fog the crab? You couldn't even see anything because they didn't have good transfer efficiency. Um, it's really important that wherever you're painting you have good ventilation. Uh, open a window. <laughs> you need to have about half a meter per second airflow. So here is a foot and a half. This is half a meter. So we're starting here. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. You need to have air moving about like that through your workspace. This does a lot of things. If you have this fog of stuff it's hard to get a good glossy clear coat 
and clear coat is one of the foggiest stick to everything things I didn't have good ventilation when I first did the hood and I got my beard glued up because I had a mask and I had a cover of hood but this much of my beard my eyelashes were gluing together and it had a rough finish it was like really hazy it took a lot of sanding and buffing to get it back to gloss but because I did base clear I could totally fix that and totally do that here's a key concept you can fix primer instead of having it stick up and then sanding it and having a gray primer spot in the middle of your clear coat because you had dust or something that sucked it up you can do a mechanical sanding on your lower coats it would be fine unless they are metallics. Metallics you have to lay down properly or else they will come back and bite you. It will, however it looks before you do clear coat is how it is. You don't think that it's going to smooth out when you put the clear coat on because it won't. I learned that the hard way. And once you put clear coat on you can't do base over it again when it's in the chemical bond stage less than 24 hours or else it will turn to a crinkly mess and uh, I learned that the hard way too. Generally speaking, solving problems wet makes more problems. Solve your problems dry with sandpaper. Gun flow, you got all kinds of settings. You can adjust your fan to be a wide fan so that you can just really cover because you have to overlap. When you paint, say your fan is only this big, which would be a really small fan. Usually your fan's about like this, you know, 12 inches or so. Say it's this, and here's your next coat coming over it. If you go over exactly, you're gonna run, but if you go down 20, 30, 50%, and then you kind of stitch it together like shingles on top of your tack coat that was really dry to begin with then you get the best result and you don't have runs if you don't do a dry tack coat first it kind of sets up like glue or geogrid or something to just kind of hold things on uh, as, as one of my mentors brian says introduce paint to the panel you can adjust the flow of the paint from the bottom here your air, your trigger thing should be all the way open. This is your air in the back. So if you narrow your fan down, you need to turn your paint down. If you have your fan big and you don't want it to be dry, you turn your paint up. Generally, you have your paint all the way open, fan all the way open, and then just narrow it down to what you need. Do test panel shooting. Um, the last thing you want to do is find out you didn't clean your gun properly the last time. I also made that mistake. And you just kind of just cow spit, just onto the panel and now you have to wait for that to dry and then sand it back flat and then start over again that's very time consuming it's way faster way cheaper use less product if you test and, if, and get everything right the first time by uh, doing a test spray on something gun speed if you are spraying really dry uh, you can have a lot of control but you're going to have to go more slowly if you go slow and you're spraying really wet and you didn't test or whatever you're going to get runs and you're going to get pinholes because you're going to have too much solvent in the paint on top of more solvent in the paint and it's going to try to come up through and it's going to dissolve its way to the surface and ruin your paint job and then you have to sand it and do over again that's expensive in time and money don't do that don't rush it take your time let stuff vent um, lay it down right, do your tack coat first. Distance. <laughs> Here's your distance right here. Um, from here to your thumb, that's about how far from the panel your paint gun should be. But it's basically your thumb, thumbs up, about this much, and adjust it as needed. If you're spraying dry, you gotta go closer. Spraying wet, you gotta hold further out. Paintings like golf, it can be really satisfying. It can, it can be so much fun. You get in the flow, you get in the zen, it's just amazing. And then your work looks awesome, and every time you come out and you look at your car, you're just like, oh, yeah, it looks so good. It's really satisfying, right? But it can also be incredibly frustrating if you try to rush it or if you do too much, too fast, too whatever, right? Terrible twos. Another takeaway from Brian. I'll leave a link to his channel in the bottom below. Light as a feather. Light coats are way better uh, for getting a feather edge if you need to blend something. If this is going to here, then this needs to go to here, and then this needs to go to here. But you plan way out here so that you can feather it and go light coats and get it where you need to be. Kind of expanding your work thing feathering it out a little as you go. Don't cut corners, uh, guide coat and block sand. If you use a guide coat that's like spraying black, you have little black marks that highlight where things are low so that you can stop. Work a big area so that it's smooth. If you use the corner and you cut, when you sand, you say you're cutting with sandpaper. So if you use the corner and be like, oh, there's a hole, let me just get this little hole here and use the corner of your block, you're gonna have a wavy, messy, nasty looking thing. 
Sometimes you have to go by hand and get around stuff and it will turn out crappy, but you don't have a choice. Um, so don't use the corner of your block, use it flat. Use everything as flat and work as big as area as you can and it will turn out all the better. You see all those cars at SEMA that have these amazing smooth paint jobs? Those people are using sanding blocks that are like this long or sometimes longer and they're doing big long strokes. That's how you get that. Don't use just a little corner, that's what I'm saying. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because I've done that a lot and it's bit me in the butt. Surface is key. Make sure that it's clean. Wax and grease remover, window cleaner, something like that. Dry cloth over after to soak up anything so that nothing can evaporate up through the paint and make pinholes. Once your surface is smooth and it's free of any wax or grease, the next thing you have to do is the tack cloth. This does a couple of things. It finds any kind of bump, any kind of imperfection, any texture problem, but it also gets any kind of dust. It sticks to the tackiness of the cloth. Don't forget the importance of this step. Abandon your pursuit of perfection. Hedge your bet. Use best practices that I'm giving you here that I've learned from the pros. This isn't coming from me, but by using these best practices that I've gathered from a lot of different painters that I've been studying under, expect dust nibs, expect mistakes. If you're painting in your garage, you're gonna have dust. Expect to and plan for correcting those as you go. If you've got a dust nib in your primer and you don't catch it and you keep going and you put base over that thing that's sticking up and then you stick clear coat over it, guess what? It's still sticking up and it's gray and it's primer and it's going to look crappy. So sand it. Make it flat. Uh, the best way to find mistakes is to use a tack cloth. A tack cloth is key for surface prep. Um, you don't tack cloth metallic base. Whatever your metallic base lays out as, it's what it is. A lot of your base coats for your base clear are 1K. There's no hardener in it. So if you go through with a wax and grease remover or screw around with that surface, the metallics are going to look crappy. And then you're, there's no amount of clear coat that you can put over sanded or botched metallics that'll make it look good again. It doesn't melt together, it just looks exactly the way it is. Sand marks, swirl marks, all that stuff is just gonna show right through the clear coat. If you're doing base clear, you can totally sand with really fine sandpaper. I'm talking 1,000 grit, 2,000 grit sandpaper. You can wet sand those things in your paint booth without creating a lot of dust and you can correct it. Especially white, white's easy to do that. White's hard to match the color. Uh, white pearl is hard to get the pearl and the metallics just right, but flat white paint's really easy to hide stuff like that. You can totally get away with that, in my opinion. Um, other people are going to disagree and say your base, however it lays, is how it lays, and just leave it. And it is the right color um, because when you, if it sticks up through your clear coat and you buff and get down to it, you can kind of get away with that because it's at least the same color all the way across. I hope this is helpful to you guys. This is what I would have wanted to watch. It helps to see examples of that. That's why I'm going to link some of the channels that I learned from in the link below. If you want to go into the curriculum of painting properly, there's a lot of talented guys on YouTube to watch. Uh, Brian, again, is one of my favorite. Uh, Tony, who's from Hawaii, he's another one of my favorites that I've been watching and learning from. He gets into a lot of advanced, kind of wild, multicolor kind of stuff and how to work that out. Uh, Brian's got some great basics, some great hardcore principles. Check him out. In the next video, I'm going to show you how I set up my booth. It cost me $15 to do my paint booth using things that I already have, things that you can find cheap or pick up for free. That's going to be the next video, and then we're going to get video six done, finally, on the Subaru series. How I paint the hood on that. I'll probably do a video on filler and blazing putty later if there's a lot of interest in this. If there is, I've learned, I've had so much practice over the last couple months that I've got it nailed down to where I've got good, pro I spent a lot of money on products and trying different stuff and listening in and, you know, if somebody says something's amazing, I just was like, okay, give it to me. It's how much? What? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and so I've got it down to where I've got a pretty good system. I'll share that with you too. Comment below. Give me some feedback. What did you like about this video? What do you want to learn more about? Do you want to see specific videos on this? 
Uh, do you want to know where I learned a specific thing from? Uh, I can give you a link to the source and let you know who I learned that from. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good info out there. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Love you guys. I really appreciate your support. If you want to support this channel, I'll click the links for the Amazon stuff below. Another thing you can do is click subscribe, like, and the bell for notifications. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon for that paint booth video. Bonus footage at the end. The painting is all about speed and pressure and chemistry. And if that wasn't enough, it's all about cleanliness too and preparation.